Welcome to part two of chapter 43. We are talking about all the ear conditions. We're going to start with otitis media and we're going to start with a video for better understanding. Otitis media is inflammation or infection of the middle ear. The middle ear is the cavity between the tympanic membrane, the eardrum, and the oval window of the inner ear. Its function is to amplify sound vibrations of the eardrum and transmit them to the inner ear. The middle ear is linked to the upper throat by the auditory tube or eustachian tube. The tube helps equalizing air pressures between the middle ear and the outside atmosphere. It also drains mucus secretions from the middle ear into the throat. The eustachian tube is usually closed, opening only when the person is yawning, swallowing, or chewing. When atmospheric pressure changes rapidly, causing a sudden feeling of fullness in the ear, such as during airplane travel, these activities can be done on purpose to open the tube, allowing air passage to equalize the pressure. Otitis media develops when the eustachian tube is blocked, commonly as a result of upper respiratory tract infections or allergies. Mucus builds up in the middle ear, creating an environment for bacteria or viruses to grow. Otitis media can occur at any age, but it is most common in small children whose eustachian tube is narrower and more horizontal. The tube opening mechanism in children is also less efficient due to the angle between the tube and the muscle acting on it. Children also have larger adenoids, the pads of lymphoid tissue located near the opening of eustachian tubes. Adenoid swelling may block the tube's opening. Other risk factors include exposure to smoking, male gender, family history, pacifier use, bottle feeding, and attending a daycare center. There are several types of otitis media. Acute otitis media is an infection that develops suddenly. Fluid and pus accumulate inside the ear. The tympanic membrane appears red and bulging. Patients typically experience fever and ear pain. In some cases, the eardrum may rupture and the ear may drain. Chronic suppurative otitis media is an infection that doesn't go away or occurs repeatedly. Tympanic membrane perforation and ear drainage are common features. Hearing is usually impaired. Otitis media with effusion is when fluid continues to accumulate in the middle ear, even after the initial infection subsides. Patients may experience a feeling of fullness and impaired hearing, but there are no signs of infection. When fluid remains for an extended period of time or returns repeatedly, the condition is known as chronic otitis media with effusion. The primary complication of ear infections is eardrum rupture, which heals spontaneously in most cases without the need for surgical repair. Untreated recurrent or chronic infections may lead to hearing loss, speech and language development delay, and rarely infection spread to surrounding tissues, including the brain. Treatment of acute otitis media includes pain medications and possibly antibiotics. Because the majority of ear infections resolve without antibiotic treatment, children with mild symptoms are usually observed for 48 hours before antibiotics are prescribed. For cases with prolonged effusion, a tiny tube may be placed in the eardrum to help drain the fluid. The tube usually falls out on its own after some time as the incision closes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. This was another excellent video that I found in YouTube. Excellent. Otitis media then. The common forms of otitis media are acute otitis media, chronic otitis media, and serious otitis media. Each type affects the middle ear but has different causes and pathologic changes. If otitis progresses or isn't treated, permanent conductive hearing loss may occur. And we understand that conductive is related to the physical part, okay? 
acute otitis media and chronic otitis media are similar. An affected agent in the middle ear causes inflammation of the mucosa leading to swelling and irritation of the ossicles within the middle ear followed by purulent inflammatory exudate. The eustachian tube and mastoid, we know the mastoid process is behind the ear, is that bony part, connected to the middle ear by a sheet of cells are also affected by the infection. If the eardrum membrane perforates, the infection can thicken and scar the eardrum and middle ear if left untreated. Necrosis of the ossicles destroy middle ear structures and causes hearing loss. That's why it's the structure and that is why it's called conductive hearing loss instead of neuro, um, sensory neural. Okay, is permanent conductive hearing loss. Okay, assessment, how we recognize the clues, the cues. Acute otitis media causes more intense pain from increased pressure in the middle ear. The patient may notice tinnitus in the form of a low hum or low pitch sound. Headaches, malaise, fever, nausea, and vomiting can occur. As the pressure on the middle ear pushes against the inner ear, the patient may have dizziness, okay? So that's how you see it in the otoscopic view of otitis media. You don't wanna see this. You don't wanna see this in, in your assessment. Okay. Interventions, take action, non-surgical management. Bed rest limits head movement that intensify the pain. Application of low heat may help reduce pain. Low heat, okay? Systemic antibiotic therapy is needed. Analgesics such as ibuprofen and acetaminophen can be used to relieve pain and reduce fever. For severe pain, Opioid analgesics may be prescribed. Antihistamines and decongestants can also be prescribed to decrease fluid in the middle ear. Surgical management. If pain persists after antibiotic therapy and the eardrum continues to bulge, a meringotomy, meringotomy surgical opening of the eardrum may be performed. Let's see the video of mering, meringotomy. Where is the video? <laughs> I don't know. Probably it's coming the video. Okay. Hair washing and showering should be avoided for several days so that water and chemicals are not introduced into the ear. Of course, post, post meringotomy. External otitis. This is the one that I was talking about in part one. This is the, the one that is uh, related to the swimming pool. External otitis is a painful condition caused when irritated or infective agents come into contact with the skin of the external ear. The result is an allergic response or inflammation with or without infection. Affected skin becomes red, swollen, and tender to touch or movement. Swelling of the ear canal can lead to temporary hearing loss from obstruction. You don't want to have this external otitis. I had it once and it's, it's very painful. Allergic external otitis is often caused by contact with cosmetic, hair sprays, earphones, earrings, or hearing aids. The most common infection organisms are Pseudonomas aerogena, Protus vulgaris, Staphylococcus aureus, and Escherichiae. But I would say that the Pseudonomas aurigiogena is the most common for this particular external otitis. A patient who have traumatized their external ear canal with sharp or small objects like hairpins, cotton-tipped 
application. Don't laugh. You're one of them. I'm sure you once used your hairpins to clean to clear to clean your ear. <laughs> or with headphones also are more susceptible to external otitis. Others at risk include people with general allergies, psoriasis, eczema, and seborrheic dermatitis. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, swimming pool water that harbors pseudonoma aeruginosa is a pathway. Is a pathway. What happened here? Um, it's a pathway for bacterial transmission and carries the risk of opportunistic infections occurring among pool users. Diseases occurring frequently among swimmers include dermatitis and folliculitis, hot food syndrome, otitis sterna, the one the topic we are talking about, ocular infections. So the monoaeruginosa is a bacterium that causes the majority of skin rashes and infections from pool and spa use. It also the cause of most cases of swimmers ear acquired in swimming pools. Now think twice before going to a pool, to a swimming pool. That's something with all these viral infections we are having in these years and all these different ages that are appearing and they are, you know, transforming and developing. Um, you don't want to catch one of these viruses or bacteria. Okay, so if you can avoid swimming pools, do it. Um, Necrotizing or malignant otitis is the most virulent from the external otitis. This extremely rare condition occurs most often in patients who are immunocompromised. Organisms spread beyond the external ear canal into the ear and skull. Death from complications such as meningitis, brain abscess, and destruction of cranial nerve 7 is possible. Look at this. Is horrible, really. Okay, assessment, recognize cues. Signs and symptoms of external otitis range from mild itching to pain with movement of the pinna or tragus, particularly when upward pressure is applied to the external canal. Patient report feeling as if the ear is plugged and hear is reduced. It's, this is, I had it. It's very painful. Nursing priorities includes enhancing confirmations, such as applying heat to the ear for 20 minutes. I didn't know this. I didn't know. I was just taking my pain medication three times a day. This can be accomplished by using towels warm with water and then wrapped in a plastic bag or by using a heating pad placed on the lowest setting. Teach the patient that minimizing head movements reduce pains. And that's good to know. All this yellow paragraph is good to know. Topical antibiotic and steroid therapies are generally prescribed to decrease inflammation and pain. Mm -hmm. Watch the patient or caregiver administer the eardrops to make sure the proper technique is used. And again, proper technique is to pull the ear from the top and to the outside so you can open the ear canal and then you pull the drops there. Ibuprofen or acetaminophen can relieve less severe pain. Teach the patient to place a cotton ball coated with petroleum jelly into the ear. When showering, the patient must be taught to avoid water sports, earbuds, and hear it aid for at least seven to ten days. People who swim about uh, should be taught to wear earplugs when swimming. And this happened to me on a vacation. We went to a swimming pool in an all-inclusive um, hotel. And I got this infection and then I had to take the airplane back to, to New York. So consider that pain with the pressure in the cabin of the airplane. It was no fun. Okay. Cerumen or foreign bodies. 
Enrollment earwax is the most common cause of an impacted ear canal. Foreign bodies such as small vegetables, bits, pencil erasers, and insects can also be impacting. Although uncomfortable serumen or foreign bodies are rarely emergencies. What? No. The, the video I saw with the insect in the, in the ear canal was impressive. And can be removed carefully by a healthcare professional. When the insect is alive and is still moving, and is this type of insects that are dropping eggs inside your ear, that's an emergency. I'm sorry. Cerumen impaction in the older adult is common, and removal of the cerumen from the older adults often improves hearing. Interprofessional collaborative care. Fullness. In the ear, usually it's a symptom, a sign and symptom. Patients are reporting this with or without hearing loss and may have ear pain, itching, dizziness, or bleeding from the ear. Mm -hmm. Cerumen or the foreign body may be visible with direct inspection. What intervention? Take action when the occluding material is cerumen. Management uh, options include um, watchful waiting, manual removal, or the use of seruminolytic agents followed by manual removal, removal or irrigation. If the cerumen is thick and dry or cannot be removed easily, the primary healthcare provider may recommend use of a seruminolytic product uh, such as Serumenex or Debrox to soften the wax before removal or you can use uh, different types of, I don't want to mention the, the name of the oil here, but there are other, other products that you can use that are safe as well. Another recommendation may include adding two or three drops of mineral oil, there you go, <laughs> mineral oil, to the ear at bedtime. After a few days of this practice, a curate or serum and spoon may then be used by the healthcare professional to remove the wax. Insects are killed before removal unless they can be coaxed out by a flashlight. A topical anesthetic can be placed in the ear canal for pain relief. Mineral oil or diluted alcohol instilled into the ear canal uh, can suffocate the insect, which is then removed by the primary healthcare provider with ear forceps. I should have included that video of the insect here. Okay, let's talk about mastoiditis. Uh, here I am seeing something that I want to highlight. Uh, do not irrigate an ear with an ear drum perforation or otitis media um, because this may spread the infection to the ear. Also, do not irrigate the ear when the foreign object is vegetable matter because this material expands when wet, making the impaction worse. An experienced healthcare professional performs removal of vegetable matter. Mastoiditis. The lining of the middle ear is continuous with the lining of the mastoid air cells, which are embedded in the temporal bone. Mm -hmm. Mastoiditis is an infection of the mastoid air cells caused by progressive otitis media. Antibiotic therapy is used to treat the middle ear infection before it progresses to mastoiditis. If mastoiditis is not managed appropriately, it can lead to brain abscess, meningitis, and death. Yeah, the, the ear infections are, I would say they are they are very, very, very urgent to, to treat. It's not that you should leave it the way it is. Think about it. The ear is connected to the throat. It can be connected and it's going to, ca to have an, is an effect on the upper respiratory. Okay? Uh, the brain. Even... Some of them can cause some vision problems. So um, it's something that you need to go immediately to the healthcare provider to be taken care of. I would say the ENT better than the PCP. 
Uh, the signs and symptoms of mastoiditis include swelling behind the ear and pain when moving the ear of the, or the head. Please don't get me wrong. I am not saying the PCP um, is going to prescribe something wrong, but the master, the, specially, the specialist uh, in, this, um, in this area is the ENT doctor, and they know, they recognize the signs and symptoms of different virus. He can tell you if it's a virus, if it's a bacteria, is it something acute or chronic or... You know what I mean? It's better to go straight to the ENT. Pain is not relieved by meringotomy. Beringotomy. Cellulitis develops on the skin or external scalp over the mastoid process, pushing the ear sideways and down. The eardrum is red, dull, thick, and immobile. Perforation may or may not be present. Lymph nodes behind the ear are tender and enlarged. Patient ha may have low-grade fever, malaise, and ear drainage. Hearing loss occurs, and CT scans show fluid in the air cells of the mastoid process. If intracranial complications are anticipated, you see, an MRI will be ordered instead of a CT scan. This type of diseases, disorders, or infections, they have to be treated immediately. Immediately, something, something common or something that is not dangerous could become, could become life-threatening. Surgical removal of the infected tissue is needed if the infection does not respond to antibiotic therapy within a few days. Let's see mastoiditis. We need a video here. Mastoid surgery is performed by removing the hollow bone behind the ear. The procedure begins by making an incision and retracting the ear forward to expose the mastoid bone surface. The honeycomb partitions of the mastoid bone are then drilled away down to where it connects to the middle ear. There are important structures that are preserved during the process, including semicircular canals, which are responsible for inner ear balance, the bone that separates the brain from the middle ear and mastoid, the sigmoid sinus, which is a large blood vessel which connects to the jugular vein in the neck, corda tympani nerve, which supplies sense of taste to the tongue, and finally, the facial nerve, which is responsible for facial movements. This would be the extent of a basic, simple mastoidectomy. Occasionally, the facial recess may be dissected out as shown here. An even more aggressive mastoid surgery may be required should a type of ear cyst called a cholesteatoma be the reason that the surgery is performed. In rare situations, the wall separating the ear canal and mastoid cavity is removed to eradicate ear disease. The eardrum and middle ear bones may even be removed. Well, did you notice that the surgery is very close to the semicircular um, canals, right? That they are in charge of the balance, right? When you got the benign parosigmal positional vertigo, the BPPV, that causes the dizziness. So I wonder if the surgery goes wrong, right? What could happen with that balance? Okay, tinnitus. T 
Tinnitus continuous ringing or noise perception in the ear is a common ear problem that occurs in one or both ears. Diagnostic testing cannot confirm tinnitus. However, testing is performed to assess hearing and rule out other disorders. Factors that contribute to tinnitus include age, sclerosis of the ossicles, Meniere disease, certain drugs, aspirin can contribute to tinnitus. Can you believe that? NSAIDs, high ceiling diuretics, quinine, aminoglycoside antibiotics, exposure to loud noise, and other inner ear problems. Especially, think about those DJs. Um, that works on the radio or, or or the ones that are putting music in, in the park, in those parties, in the parks, right? Okay. Another NCLEX examination challenge question, right? Um, the selector that apply. I will take care. I will pay attention to these questions. Very important questions. Meniere disease, pathophysiology review. Meniere disease is a condition that includes a classic trio of symptoms, episodic vertigo, tinnitus, and hearing loss. Episodes also called attacks can last several days, although some patients report ongoing symptoms of varying intensity at all times. Patients can be almost to totally incapacitated during an attack and recovery can take hours to days. Yes, have you ever seen somebody with Meniere disease? Hmm. Signs and symptoms include vertigo, hearing loss, and tinnitus. Vertigo is often accompanied by nausea, vomiting, headache, and nystagmus, rapid eye movement, blood pressure, pulse, and respiration may be elevated. Hearing loss occurs first with the low frequency tones in some patients. Professor, but you said the difference between Meniere disease and benign positional paroxysma vertigo is that the hearing loss is present, right, um, in Meniere's, but also the, t the nystagmus is only it's only present in the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Yes, but some patients are developing these two symptoms in BPPV, okay? The only thing that you are not going to see hearing loss in BPPV, patients sometimes confuse the popping in one of the ears it's like they are doing their daily activities and some somehow they can hear like Pah! and then the nystagmus start occurring the dizziness they can also have vomiting nausea and with that vomiting i've seen patients that they are having problems holding urine some patients with that dizziness they can urinate while they are sitting. They don't have control of their uh, bladder, okay? Um, okay, interventions. Non-pharmacologic treatment for Meniere disease includes diet and lifestyle adjustment. As some patients with this condition are sensitive to triggers such as high salt intake, caffeine, no monosodium glutamate, alcohol, nicotine, stress, and allergens. Teach patients how to modify their diet accordingly. It is also important to teach the client to avoid activities that place them at risk of experience vertigo, such as standing on chairs or ladder. I've seen some patients with dizziness that um, they were doing a lot of exercises. Follow me, follow, follow me guys on this. Patients were exercising, you know, they were training for certain sports and they lost a lot of fluids 
and with the fluids they are losing salts right so what they are doing is they are drinking their gatorade and adding on top of that water with some salt and then because of the extra salt they are having the dizziness and the nystagmus okay here they are mentioning are sensitive to triggers such a high salt intake so then it comes the problem you don't know if the dizziness is related to regular vertigo or regular or menier disease or the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo which is related to the semicircular canals we spoke at the beginning in part one i think okay is related to the crystals and this the bpp is that is um benign it could be addressed with the dix hole pike maneuver the menier is going to come with hearing loss okay and also some nyst nystagmus so there you have the difference Another NCLEX examination that you, you should pay attention to that. Let's go to acoustic neuroma. And acoustic neuroma is a benign tumor of the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve 8. Check your cranial nerve sheet that often damages other structures as it grows. Depending on the size and exact location of the tumor, damage to hearing facial movement and sensation can occur hmm that sounds similar to the trigeminal neuralgia right an acoustic neuroma can cause neurologic signs and symptoms as the tumor enlargers in the brain signs and symptoms okay uh signs and symptoms begin with tinnitus and progresses to gradual sensory neural hearing loss later patients have constant mild to moderate vertigo as the tumor enlarges nearby cranial nerves are damaged the tumor is diagnosed with an mri if the patient cannot tolerate the mri high resolution ct with or without contrast can be used Okay, so that concludes chapter 43. Thank you.